Thanks everybody for coming. My name is Brian Ford and I am a, um, very fortunate to be one of the Rubinius developers working with EngineYard. I want to give a big thanks to EngineYard for their support of Rubinius and also for RubySpec. We started RubySpec back when Rubinius was just an open source project that people contributed to uh, in December of 2006 and worked on that for a little over a year. Um, but EngineYard has been really great in uh, helping us and RubySpec is something that benefits everybody in the Ruby community. So my talk is what does my Ruby do? And the reason I named it that, what does my Ruby do, is because everybody probably has a preference for which Ruby that they are running. And they put me right in the middle of the implementers track, but this isn't really about Ruby implementation, although it's very important to it. It's also relevant, I think, for everybody who uses Ruby. Because as you write your Ruby code and you want to run your Ruby code, you want to know if your Ruby code will run correctly, or at least the way you expected it to. So that's a pretty big number. That's probably more times than I've heard Maverick and Socialist in the last six weeks, but <laughs> neither label being accurate, of course. Um, that number is right now how many things that we call uh, expectations there are in Ruby spec. And we'll get into what that means, but just on the face of it, that's a big number. And when you think about your Ruby code and the number of different combinations and the ways that you could you know, put together those 30,000 things, it's pretty huge. Before we get too far in, though, <clears throat> I have to you know, give this disclaimer. This project, more than any project that I've ever worked on, um, has been a bike shed project. And uh, it's convinced me that there's no way that you will satisfy everyone, which is a good thing to learn early in life. So the things that I'm going to explain are the rationale for some of the decisions that I've made and some of the background that you don't see if you just go you know, check out the project or look at the documentation that we have available. But recognize that it's my opinion about the way things should go based on my experience primarily working with Rubinius in terms of implementation. But it is a big bike shed. Okay, so Ruby spec, what is that? It's an attempt to make a complete, executable, this really sucks, this doesn't work from down low, specification for the Ruby programming language. And we're gonna look at each one of those components, except you guys already know what Ruby is. The current status, uh, there's this number of things. Files are what you would think of as files, I'll explain what they mean. 9,203 examples and 30,866 expectations. An expectation is every time you say should or should receive, it's an expectation that some p bit of code behaves some way. And examples are groups of things. I know that when our spec was just starting out, there was this big talk about um, one sort of expectation per example, which was a really important idea in that you are testing a facet of behavior with each thing, but Ruby is very complex, and sometimes it makes more sense to have a little uh, coarser granularity. So instead of having 30,866 examples, which we certainly could, that's been made a little bit more manageable by looking at those things in collections that we call examples. The goals of the project are basically these four. One definitely is verification, in that if you say that you support Ruby version 1.8.6, how do you know that? You run this and if you fail somewhere, either there's a problem with the spec or there's a problem with your implementation. The other one is compatibility. It just comes right out of verification. If I want to run my code on JRuby on Windows and it runs fine on Rubinius on Linux, this is, a, this is an avenue for verifying that. Development, that's the stuff that probably everybody that's been in this room is really interested in today, implementations. It's an effort to drive the implementation by identifying what you need to do and then do it instead of like writing some stuff and trying to figure out if it actually worked. And finally, experimentation. There's that old saying that there's as many Lisps or Lisp implementations as there are CS students or something like that, you know, like everybody writes a Lisp. That would be a dream come true if every CS student was writing a little bit of a uh, Ruby implementation um, and, and experimenting with ways of making Ruby faster. That would benefit everybody tremendously. 
when I visualize Ruby spec, this is kind of a humorous picture that comes to mind. It's a safety net underneath you, and it could be under your program or under you, you know, sitting there typing in your chair as an implementer. So the structure of it, we use hierarchies, obviously, to manage complexity. And that's what we've done here in that we have the very top is Ruby spec. Uh, underneath that, we have <clears throat> broken it into provisionally 1.8 and 1.9. I did this early on because I had no clue really what 1.9 was. It was a nebulous cloud over here, and I knew that we were going to target 1.8. This was December of 2006, and Rubinius could do things like add two numbers. So I threw stuff in 1.8 in, in sort of in a sense, and this, this actually came a little bit later when we broke Ruby spec out, but conceptually I put things in 1.8 because that's what we were, we were targeting. I would really like that to actually go away and see something like this. So the three divisions underneath there are core, language, and library. Core means everything like array, hash, fixed num, big num. Language is all the keywords essentially in the Ruby language. Things like while and if, and the library is everything that you have to say require blah, and it comes with Ruby. The files that are in those directories look something like this. Index underscore spec. If that was in the core array directory, then what you're talking about is the index method on the array class. And that correspondence is primarily to give you a very easy way to index and say, I'm looking at this bit of Ruby code. I want to know what this bit does. Is it a method? Yes. What class is it on? Go there, and you find your method. It's, we try to make it very consistent, and there's a script that we actually have that will spit out, including turning symbols like array reference into element reference spec. I'm going to go back for just a second. In the language, this was a really, you know, again, this is a, a decision I made. But basically, when I think about Ruby, I think about things before I think about actions, because it's an object-oriented language, and we make objects, and then we send messages to them, essentially. So to me, objects are a bit more primary than functional things. There's many ways that you could slice up the pie that's Ruby grammar based on assigning to a variable or any other sort of action that you think you could take. But instead of, instead of trying to like make my idea of the behavior of Ruby match someone else's, I said we simply have things like keywords. Therefore, while under, underscore spec has specs that deal with while and if. And um, it's pretty consistent. There's a few things that are clumped together. End doesn't make any sense all by itself. So it's actually sort of subsumed into the if uh, spec. By the way, you're welcome to ask questions. I will really, I have like three different talks jammed into one. I will try to go through these and have time for questions, but if something is burning up your curiosity, please ask me. So I didn't dream up the idea of testing Ruby. There were people that came before me, and when I looked at what they had worked on, which was good work, I kind of saw something like this, and I did not think that I could polish that stone wheel, in a sense, into something um, that would be really good for what I was trying to do. I really wanted a wheel that would go on that car, which is an awesome car. So credit goes, you know, especially to uh, Ruby itself has tests. The first time I built Ruby, uh, you know, I saw the test directory, make test, zip, OK, it was done. I was like, wow, everything works. I didn't know what the coverage of those tests actually were, which is an issue, um, but Ruby had tests there. So, and we've ported a lot of those to Ruby spec. Ruby test was a project um, that's also very interesting, and BFTS, I don't know exactly what that stands for, but it was a project to make a better Ruby test, I believe. So credit to those, those projects. Why, why are spec like? Why, why not just make BFTS or Ruby test better. And it comes down to this reason right here. Why, why RSpec like? If we look at a typical RSpec assertion, there's three parts. There is an element to that that groups. And there is an element that provides some sort of description. 
and then there's a code example. So describe is a way to set up a context of sort of a, a, a universe of discourse in a sense. There's the it, which allows you to associate textual, almost like metadata, and then the code example. The RSpec syntax is, I think, a crucial element of it because when I look at assert A comma B in a beautiful language like Ruby, it makes me, you know, cringe. Um, no one can agree, and even though everybody can say that expected comes before actual, it makes no logical sense that it necessarily comes before, and there's other unit tests that flip those around, and every time I do something, I can't remember exactly which way it goes. I just, I hate that syntax in Ruby. Something like A dot should equal B couldn't be, in my opinion, clearer, so that's what I like. And, oops. The debate over whether it should be a dot should equal b or a dot should dot equal b, I think, is moot. RSpec 1, I don't really have a strong preference either way, but I chose the way that RSpec uses for the legions of people who are writing RSpec specs for their code. And I want them to contribute, um, and I want them to understand it. And so Bacon is a great framework, but I don't agree with, you know, taking a very small piece of the pie and saying that's what we're gonna do. So, formal specification. We had some great news recently. Um, a colleague of mine actually informed me of it because I don't read Ruby, uh, Ruby talk that much. But there's a, an effort to write a formal specification for Ruby, which is great. Um, and I haven't really had a chance to talk to Mots about this yet, but uh, you know, hopefully will. I mean, it's a really exciting thing, I think. Some people have you know, an opinion to the contrary, but I think it's a good thing overall. A formal specification is gonna look something like this. It's gonna tell you this thing should do something in a sense, because what it's basically doing is distinguishing everything that should be alike from everything that should be different. I mean, it's just a matter of basically drawing lines in the sand and say that if your lines look like this, you're Ruby, and if they don't, you're not, probably going to be a little bit more formal. As soon as you add some numbers, then you have, you know, something that makes more sense, I guess. But it's basically going to be the same sort of thing. What you might realize if you've ever done dash FS while running mspec or, or, or Ruby spec is that it looks very much like what you could actually generate from the spec suite itself. And so I think the idea that, um, that you're gonna write a formal specification without examples of code is never gonna work because somebody is gonna be implemented, they're gonna go read the spec, and then they're gonna go write some example code, and that's exactly what that is. So, I think those two go together, and I think that, I, I'm hopeful that the body of example code that we have right now will become part of a formal specification. I don't know what barriers there are to such a thing, but that's sort of my rationale for why. So the really challenging part of writing the Ruby specs is dealing with things like there's different platforms, there's different implementations, there are different versions. Platforms have different operating systems on the same hardware, they have different operating systems on different hardware. There's big Indian and little Indian and so many different ways that you can put those collections together. And you can take the perspective that that's metadata to the examples. Like if A dot should equal B, A dot should equal B anywhere that you run Ruby code, otherwise what are you running, right? Unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. As soon as you get into file handling or big Indian versus little Indian issues when you have pack and it's got a specification for that you're gonna output that little Indian, there's a lot more to it. So instead of being metadata, I decided that the guards need to be a part of the spec and that the spec explains exactly what will happen on a particular platform. So we have a guard, platform is for instance Windows, and inside that, that code will execute if that guard recognizes that what you're running on is Windows. Um, We've got the inverse of that because we're using blocks and blocks are not you know, simply conditionals. We're using blocks like a very simple if. We're using them because they're sort of 
logically consistent with the describe and it. And so instead of introducing, like say, you could do that with this real Ruby code, but it looks, <clears throat> when I looked at different ways of doing that, and for instance, the Ruby test project has guards that use things like if version something. When I looked at that, I didn't like the disconnect. I liked the more uniformity with the blocks, and so that's what, that's what we're using. The platform is guard itself, if we go look at the code, also hides a lot of complexity that I think will tend to bleed out. I mean, you, you can abstract that into a method, a class method, whatever else, but that's, I did it mostly for the, the consistency. One of the things that really complicates, um, implementing the platform is guard uh, is identifying what implementation, um, and there's a, there's a couple other guards that's really important. And so we've made this strong push for this variable, uh, this uh, constant Ruby engine. And you can describe it as all different sort of things, but to me it's, your implementation is what makes your Ruby code run. That's kind of like an engine that makes a car run. So for whatever reason, whether it's clear or not, we've, we've basically said we really need this constant Ruby engine. But when we've discussed it, it's not always understood what it means. And basically what it is is simply a constant that the implementation sets. If it, it tells you that you're JRuby, then what you can expect is that you're going to behave in the spec like anywhere where you state in a guard that you're JRuby. So it just takes the ambiguity out of it. And if you go look at the MSpec code, you'll see that there's hoops that I jumped through. Um, JRuby runs on top of um, on Java, and I'm sure Charles can explain this better, but, but basically when you're running on top of that, the, the, in a sense your platform is Java, not Windows or Mac OS X. And so it, it, we jump through some special hoops in that case to say, yeah, we're still on JRuby. So this is the reason for Ruby Engine, and I'm not sure what Iron Ruby would actually call it. These are ones, of course, Ruby VM slash, you know, 1.8. It would just be Ruby, because that's what it is. The version is something that I tried seven different ways from Sunday to keep out of the spec, but um, Charles, convinced me, and uh, I think he's correct, that it has to be there, and it has to be persistent. I wanted, I wanted version stuff to fall away as we marched forward. So if today array at returns a fixed num, and tomorrow it returns a string, uh, we fix a spec to expect a string, and we forget everything else. But Charles explained that you really can't do that <clears throat> when you have to support more than one version. And when you have an orderly end-of-life process, you need something like this. So the guard is Ruby version is. It takes a string that it parses into a number so that it can do things like that. So you can use the inclusive end or exclusive end range, and you can say, in this particular case, it raises a local jump error, is going to be true from the beginning of time to 1.8.7. Another uh, guard that is really important is um, something called Ruby bug guard. And this only executes when it identifies that you're running on what we call standard Ruby. So this introduces the idea that there's one standard for Ruby and uh, this guard will not execute what's in that block if it identifies that it's Ruby and it matches the version, which is a second argument to it. The first argument is a string, and what we'd like you to do is put the red mine tracker number for that bug or the earlier um, Ruby core, Ruby talk, whatever, however it was sort of tracked, number that identifies that and um, so that we have that, that correspondence between there. And there's a bunch of guards because there's a lot of different ways that these things can look differently. I mentioned the endianness. There's an extended on guard for implementations to be able to put in there what they actually do differently. There's something called quarantine, which says don't absolutely ever run this thing because something really bad is happening. It gives us a chance to say, okay, now let's investigate what happened instead of people going, oh my God, it's you know, seg faulting this, we have to tear it out. Instead of like 
What I try to do is keep it very conservative when we mess with specs themselves. And so what these guards do is sort of twofold. One is they make it explicit what something is expected to do, and then they make it more formal also. So there's a bunch of them in there. OK. If you are a CS student, which I was and I'm no longer, or if you've studied programming, you should have learned this math. If you graduated from high school, you probably learned this math. So whenever people start talking about math, we often get glazed stares. Here's some math, and I think it's really important to just sort of cover briefly. I'm not trying to be pedantic, but I, I want people to think about this. We define a function f from a domain A to a image or range B. And we say that that function is onto if the image of f is equal to b, whatever we're calling that. And they don't agree whether it's range or codomain or whatever. But the idea is that anything in A maps to an element in B. Then we can look at our domain, which is if we think about we're testing a Ruby method, all the possible inputs. So let's say array at, it can take things that look like numbers. And if we, if we think about all, everything we could possibly send there in there, and if we can break that into a set of distinct sets so that you get everything back when you put them all together, but when you take any two of them, they share nothing in common. So what you, what you have then is what's called a disjoint partition of A. And you can typically take that one step further if you can define what's called an equivalence relation, which you can because any partition is an equivalence relation. Then you can only take one thing out of every one of those disjoint sets, and you can test that one thing. And if you've done things correctly, that one thing will assure you that every other thing in that set, when you give it to that method, is going to give you something in the range of that particular set. And so this is a little bit of a, a, a side thing, but when we look at Ruby spec, one of the things that we need is more people looking at those specs, understanding how the method behaves, its various facets of behavior, and ensuring that we have s sort of done this process uh, correctly. So it's a huge place that we need a lot of help and, and people's attention. And if this doesn't make sense, I mean, ask me about it later or just do a little bit of research. But typically, basic math, like through algebra, is going to teach these concepts. So apologies if that was boring as hell to anybody. Did I say complete? Yes, the goal is a complete spec. Um, how complete are we? I have no idea. I can say that with Rubinius passing, like, or say failing 500 or 600 out of those, you know, 9,000 or whatever examples, let's say, we run a lot of Ruby code. So we must be doing a lot of things correctly, and we're passing a lot of specs, so we can kind of assume that there's some correspondence there. But one of the things that we need to develop is some way to understand completeness. You t look at typical coverage, you can't just do like code coverage and say, are we complete because we covered all this code? Because which implementation do you use? We could say we use MRI 1.8, but then you start questioning, well, is there you know, overlapping facets of behavior that as soon as you implement them in a different way, will you no longer sort of have that overlap? So it's a, it's a, it's a challenging question. And oops. What, what about accurate? So we write all these thousands of, of things. I mean. They run, that's some like assurance that we've, we've done what 1.8 says it does, but is it accurate? This is where we need a formal audit process for um, the specs. And it's, you know, it's open for development. So I'm going to move on to the next, but before I do that, you know, I have no idea when my talk is supposed to end, so let me just check that real quick. 2.55, OK. OK, we're changing gears now. For the Ruby spec project, I'll tell you a little story. When, you know, from like December 2006 until I would say like April of 2007, there was a group of us 
in Portland, a small group that, that would kind of get together and we would, on the weekends, and we'd try to do something with Rubinius. And of course, wanting it to run the specs, I wanted it to run our spec. And we labored and labored and labored. And it's not that RSpec is bad software, it's just that RSpec uses complex Ruby features. And you don't know how hard it is to implement some of those. I mean, one time my laptop, it like used up all my disk space that was free essentially, um, because I was trying to trace what it was doing to figure out why the hell the thing just went off into space when you try to you know, load RSpec. And I could not for you know, hours upon hours narrow that down to a, a, a reproducible test case that I could understand. So what I started writing after talking with Evan one day and I said, hey, how hard is it to implement, say, passing an argument to a block? And so we sort of looked at this very minimal set of features that you need to support something like the syntax that, that uh, our spec provides. Um, <clears throat> So I wrote this thing that was kind of a mini RSpec, and I started calling it mini RSpec because I had no intention that it would ever take over any of the duties of RSpec. It was merely a crutch to get us somewhere. And then Ryan Davis started giving me a lot of shit. What's the M in MSpec? This isn't mini in my book sort of thing. And so I decided that that's the M in MSpec. I hope you guys understand what that symbol is. Um, <clears throat> so MSpec is actually a very purpose-built little bit of software to enable us to run the specs on Ruby implementations that may only be able to support a few features, like methods, classes, and maybe yielding to a block. It's programmed really simply. I don't use inheritance anywhere in there because included modules, which is something that's essential to doing inheritance right, were really hard to do correctly in Rubinius. And partially that was because say, you know, I didn't really understand, it was hard to debug, but I understand a lot better, I still know that they're hard to do. So I don't wanna move away from that. Uh, it's also sort of event driven in a sense, and it's pretty modular. That said, there's a lot of files now. When I rewrote it like the third time, um, John Lamb said, what the hell is this thing? It's so complicated, I can't figure out where anything goes, that sort of thing. So there's a lot more files, but each piece of it, if we look at it individually, is still very simple. So still kind of begs the question of why not RSpec? Why not just identify a better set of RSpec? Why not contribute back to RSpec? These are you know, questions that I've had. And <clears throat> some smart aleck you know, basically came up with this sort of quote. And that really summarizes the idea that RSpec is being used in applications all over the place, doing all sorts of complex stuff that are way more complicated than Ruby spec, even with the 30,000 whatever things. I don't worry about namespace clashes. I name something uh, spec context. I don't care if you have a spec context in your application because Ruby does not have any spec context in Ruby. And that's, those are the sort of decisions that make it possible for me to do things in MSpec that you, you just can't disregard so easily in our spec. So it's a very different problem domain, and that's why. Um, and I think, you know, Dave and everybody who's contributed to RSpec, I think they're doing wonderful work. And so, I, you know, I applaud them tremendously. I've never contributed anything to RSpec because I don't think that it's a fit for this particular problem. That said, we're trying to make every effort to have the specs execute correctly on RSpec. And I haven't tried that recently, but that's definitely, you know, a goal. I'd like people to be able to just say, you know, spec and do something and have it work. <sighs> specs are kind of a kind of complicated. You can do something very simple where you just yield to the block, the block executes, and you check that, say, it raised an exception or not. What I implemented instead was something that has a whole bunch of events that sort of happen. These are all the things from before any specs are run through uh, loading a file, because an exception can occur when you load that file. Say you have a syntax error, and those were just sort of falling right through. Every one of these, every one of these events I added only after it became necessary to like sort of either tally something or give the user some sort of information. And so these are the sort of, as you, you go through uh, executing the block that is described and inside that executing the blocks, the it blocks, these are the things that I found to be important events along the way. Uh, MSpec itself is made up of 
as it's executing these sort of three, three ideas. There's filters that say yes or no to execute a spec. And if you've used, say, dash E in R spec, you know that you can, you can say execute a spec that matches this description. There's actions that are things that can occur. You know, it notices that you loaded a file, and so it'll do something. And there's formatters. That's where it collects up all the information and either outputs it to you while it's running or at the end. So here's a very simple example of a filter. It's going to check that the description, you know, when you put the describe plus the it together, every time it goes to execute one of those blocks, it's going to say, does it match this? And it does a regex, regex match on that. Um, escaped regex. So if it's got special characters, let's get escaped. We have another switch that will allow you to pass in raw regex. We have another thing that will match, say, tags, which I'll talk about in a minute. But that's the idea of a filter. All those things are implemented as a filter. And that's just something that says, yo, I want to be um, notified before you run any spec. And if there's a filter in there and it returns false, the spec doesn't execute. That's all, that's all there is to it. Uh, spec debug. This is an example of an action. Um, our debugger isn't working right now in the new, in the new C++ VM, but you know, it will. And the idea here is that before you hit that spec, drop me into the debugger so I can step through the whole thing. And I just found that being really useful instead of going in and, and you know, putting in prints or trying to break you know, into execution. It just, it just basically executes our, our debugger right before it goes to execute that spec, and you can step through it. Um, and finally, uh, the formatter. You know, there's, we have the, the spec doc or spec docs, whatever, output, which is kind of cool. It gives you all the text. We have the dotted formatter. And uh, Evan was down in Australia and uh, at, a, at, a, at a sprint. It was really cool. You know, a bunch of brand new guys were contributing. And they got tired of all the dots, and so they made this which is just kind of fun, you know. It, <clears throat> it actually uses ASCII um, color codes, and so the F turns red, the E turns red, that sort of thing. Tags. <laughs> for all those regex, you know, fiends in the audience, and for the rest of us. That regex matches this, and this little thing has a few parts. Fails is a tag. And what you can do with fails is say, do or do not run a spec if it's marked as fails. It can have a comment, which go in parentheses. The colon is the single delimiter that breaks that apart from the rest. And the rest is a, a full description. So take the described text, put the it text onto it, string that all together, that matches. So fails, if it says don't run fails, it will, it will insert a filter. It will have that full text. If that full text matches verbatim, that doesn't run or does run, depending on what you ask for. To apply those tags to um, specs, we have a <clears throat> tag command. And what it creates is a file that shadows the spec file in a different directory. This is metadata for the specs. It doesn't have anything to say about the correctness of the spec or anything else, but it's metadata. In, in our implementation, say we fail that. That doesn't mean anybody else fails that. And so there was a way, there was a need for a way to identify those things external to the specs, because we don't want to go in and muck with those. Other people depend on them. Last resort, you go in and muck with those specs. Um, but we need a way to not say seg fault when we're trying to run a group of specs. So we can omit the ones that are, say, failing or unstable or incomplete. Which brings me to another big bike shed sort of issue, and that is why not support something like pending? And then MSpec does support pending in a way, but again, you know, some smart aleck, this is his opinion of pending. It's an incomplete solution. But, there's always a but, it's often good enough, and that's, you know, it's true because everybody tells me all their reasons why pending is a great idea, and I hear them and I understand what they're saying, but I don't agree that it's valid for Ruby spec. And the reason is, is because, you know, I don't care what you do with your private clone, but when we push stuff to Ruby spec, it either is a spec or it's not. 
And a bigger reason is that there's real need for spec metadata. I'll get to you in one sec. But it's metadata. And whether something are, is pending or not does not say anything about the accuracy of the statement that you want to put in the spec. It's metadata. And we have tags for metadata. And it's a much more robust solution that has a lot of different uses. And we can grow it. Pending, you can't grow. So yes? Does this have anything, uh, or rather, if uh, somebody is new to this and wants to write, would like to contribute specs, um, does this reflect on the a front door for people to start where we where where to start begin writing specs? So, are you saying if we had pending in the specs? Yes. Okay. What's the front door look like? So the question is, you know, it, sort of in in particular, if we have pending, would that be a good marker for people to sort of identify a location to contribute, or in general, what's a good way to contribute? Um, there. Um, there are specs. I, I will answer the first one categorically. No, I don't think pending is a good place to begin contributing. We do have the ability to generate stubs for every method on any class that you want to hand Ruby. And we typically run that in MRI, in, in Mozza's Ruby, and generate those stubs with a uh, comment that this spec needs to be reviewed for completeness. And the reason I say that that's a, a better solution is because if you've written one spec, for one method that may identify one facet of its behavior, there's not a way to be able to say, I think I'm done with this. But if we leave a marker there that is, and, and you could say pending, but the reason, again, that I don't agree with pending is because we can attach tag metadata to any spec, and we can attach it just as easily to uh, a spec like this needs to be reviewed for completeness in a variety of different ways without overloading the word pending. Pending is one word. We have an infinite vocabulary in our specs, and that's why I disagree with using pending. So in general, what's the best way to, what, what's the best way to contribute? Um, if you know anything about Ruby, pick some part of Ruby, either some part in your application or some part that you're interested in, and go read the spec. Does it make sense? Does it make sense relative to what the pickaxe or RI says? Um, does some bit of your code not work right in a particular implementation and you're trying to figure out why you go right away? I mean, it's basically very wide open for how you would actually begin to contribute. Um, run the specs on whatever Ruby is installed in your program. There's a freaking million different or on, on your OS. There's a bunch of different versions of Ruby. 1.8.7 and stable 1.8.6 are running a lot cleaner. There's still things that we haven't identified in terms of version differences from those older ones. And we'd like that to be very accurate. My, uh, my understanding is, and we can ask for an official word, but 1.8.5 is no longer maintained. I don't want to add any, any, any Ruby version is 1.8.5. 1 1 uh, 1.8.6 in many different varieties, and of course, obviously, stable is out there. So all those are areas that you could um, look at. And that's, a, yes? Just about the pending. What about pending to pop the locks? So like it or string? Yeah. Yeah, you can, you, can leave, you can leave those in. MSpec ignores them. If you put an empty block, MSpec will um, raise an exception that there's no expectation. And uh, that actually helped us find a number of things where someone had done A equal, 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 B instead of A dot should. So pending, if you want to leave pending with a description, MSpec ignores it. And that's, that's, that's as far as I will go unless someone like holds me down and whatever, gives me a something um, in, into the pending sort of territory. So real quick. Uh, the Ruby spec is, is really just beginning. You know, if we're 99% complete, we're really just beginning because there's some really neat ideas. And these might be like far out ideas or whatever, but these are some possibilities that I think are, are realistic and of, of great interest to everybody who's working on implementing Ruby. You know, what if we understood, in a sense, a little bit more about what Ruby code means? What if you could do something that analyzed your code and identified specs that they think that, that, that this program thinks you should run? Or what if you say the something should, whatever, not should, but the something does this or that? It analyzes that list of specs and identifies 
code, that's kind of weird, you know, code that your program would actually run. Or analyzing the standard library. Ruby, a lot of talk about, you know, in Ruby about duct typing, and it's very useful. But is the use of, say, toString in the core library consistent in that can I pass anywhere that you expect to act like a string, something that implements toString, and expect the Ruby core library to handle that correctly? And a lot of these things are like higher level views of how Ruby behaves that we don't really have right now. We do a lot of like little example code. Oh, it doesn't work this way. Why doesn't it go read the code, you know, go do something else? I think that there's, there's a, a lot to be said, you know, source code, transformation, um, and understanding more what is going on in there. Finally, there's, you know, the idea of collecting performance information while it's running. The, the overhead of MSpec, for instance, is going to be consistent. Statistically, you could end up extracting that information out and getting to some better information about particularly what type of code is being run and how long it's taking. We want to add an action that benchmarks so that you can keep a private benchmark of the Ruby spec. And if you are then implementing something in the VM and you run that and suddenly, you know, you've like 10x execution somewhere, it's going to be really apparent. That's relative to your private, you know, sort of benchmark of what run, running the specs are. But it helps us identify further vectors besides just pass or fail in a spec. Um, you can find out more about RubySpec at rubyspec.org, and uh, it is a GitHub project, RubySpec. I think it would be really cool someday, it's not complete yet, but I would love for you to be able to do gem install mspec, gem install rubyspec, mspec, and it runs all those specs. I don't think it's really realistic right now because it's not very complete. You'd have to be doing gem update a lot. So get clone, do mspec on your rubyspec clone. Please contribute. We've had some great contributions. Google Summer of Code. I want to thank a few people. Arthur Schreiber, No Karma on IRC. Um, Federico, I can't pronounce his last name. Um, F, and it's B-U-I-L-E-S on IRC. Two Google Summer of Code folks who did a great, great job. Um, Yuli-san is uh, the 1.9 maintainer, and she's been helping us get 1.9 specs in there awesome because there's a you know dearth of those specs. Um, Charles and the JRuby guys, um, Iron Ruby, Jim DeVille and uh, Iron Ruby has been awesome. He's helping us understand how things work on Windows. I have no idea. Um, so if I missed anybody, you know, a big round of thanks to, to everybody who's who's helping out my um, my colleagues as well. No contribution is too small, but a little bit of a rant. Please don't send me pull requests. I think that GitHub's like make a clone easy where I can push to is great. I think that the fork thing is way over the top. What I end up seeing is repositories where people were figuring out how to use Git and I can't make heads or tails of what they have. If you can like decide this is what you'd like to see, please use format patch. Put a ticket on Ruby spec. It helps us track things better. And I curse less. So thank you very much, and questions. I have a few minutes. Yes, Wilson. Can you talk a little bit about the, whether or not instance eval is something that new implementations need immediately to run Ruby spec, and whether that is evil and or et cetera? You can run a lot of the specs with just yielding to a block. And I once made a very, very simple thing that just described yield and, you know, an expectation that says actual, equal, equal, expected, raise an exception if it doesn't. If you can implement a proc where you can, you know, objectify a block and, and save that away, then you can collect a whole list of things and then run them. Then you get before and after actions, which is great. So that's a step up. Uh, in order to be absolutely correct, you need instance eval. I should have that particular spec somewhere. It has to do with a constant and constant lookup. It does not work if you call the block. You have to instance eval it. So at some point, you have to support instance eval. I tried for the longest time. 
not ever to have to require that, but sometime you will. And if you're working on implementation, seriously, if you're like a you know, grad student or somebody and you're like, I want to work on a Ruby implementation and you want to run the specs, talk to me. We can write a very simple spec that will allow you to run tons of spec, or a very simple like M spec type thing that will allow you to uh, run tons of specs until you can you know, bootstrap up more. So anyone else? All right, thank you very much, folks. I think I'm out of time.